Okay, it's two o'clock. So we'll get started in just a couple of seconds. We'll give about 10 seconds for people to join the meeting. All right, so welcome everyone. This workshop is Introduction to Gathering Found Data, and it's a low barrier workshop that will be demonstration driven lecture on resources you can use to collect freely available data that you could use in a project. There is uh, no prior knowledge required, but hopefully there will be a little something in this workshop for everyone. My name is Brendan McCarthy, and I am the metadata librarian at Rensselaer. So a little bit about myself. I work in tech services, in library information services, in the division of the chief information officer. I conceived this workshop as a way the Rensselaer libraries could support um, data dexterity initiatives at RPI. And one thing we'll see today is that the line between metadata and data can sometimes be a little fuzzy. But since metadata is, in its um, most reductionist definition, data about data, it made sense uh, for me as the metadata librarian to lead this workshop and share some of my knowledge. Um, there's so much data on the web now, it can be a challenge to know where to go or how to get started. So we'll jump right into that today. And I'm just going to turn my camera on for a second here. And uh, before we do this, I just want to thank everybody who's here. This is a great turnout today. Um, I especially want to greet and thank our ARCH students who are here, uh, as well as all of our students. And I'm very happy that we've got current students, graduate students, faculty, staff, and alums. So hello, everyone. Uh, I know things are pretty difficult right now with the pandemic and it's impacting your experiences. So I just wanted to say that I'm sorry I can't be delivering this workshop to you in person. Um, and I do hope that our time together today gives us a sense of connection to Rensselaer Libraries. So I wanted to let you know that I'm thinking of you all and I'm looking forward to seeing you in the library soon. All right. So I am presenting from Troy, New York today, but I'm not at the Folsom Library or on the Rensselaer campus. So to just test the chat, um, where is everybody from today? You can send me a message in chat. You don't have to send it to everyone, just send it to me. It'll be anonymous. All right, Albany, Jersey, nice. Troy, across town, <laughs> New Hampshire. All right, great. So we have people from all over. Massachusetts, nice. All right, so let's start with our learning objectives today. So we want to increase our data literacy skills. We wanna get comfortable interacting with a few end user interfaces to understand data set discovery and data set finding, and to be confident in and understand the ways in which we can locate data through browsing or searching and combining both of these techniques. So at the end of the workshop today, you'll be able to do the following things. Use a library research database called Statistical Abstract of the United States. You'll be able to locate data sets that are available for free and can be used, reused, and combined in order to complete various projects. This workshop is really going to focus on data sets of high quality. You'll be able to organize your found data. You'll get a basic understanding of rights and permissions. And finally, I'm going to give everyone a list of authoritative data set repositories they can go to after this workshop to find data sets of their own. And I'll take questions at the end. Um, my colleague uh, posted me and 
posted in chat. Um, she's helping me field questions. So if you have a question, just make sure to send your question to all panelists in the chat. Now we're going to look at three specific resources today in this order. They were listed in the description for the event, but I just wanted to refresh everyone. So number one, we're gonna look at World Bank Open Data Catalog. Number two is ProQuest's Statistical Abstract of the United States. And three is data.gov. Now, at this point, you might be wondering, what is found data? So let's talk about that a little bit. Found data is data that has already, uh, these data have already been collected, usually for some other purpose. But the important thing is that these data have been uh, made freely available. So the open data movement has encouraged the finding, sharing, and reuse of this data. We're focusing on the finding aspect of this today. To elaborate on this concept of found data uh, a little more, since the internet, open data have made it lots easier to share and reuse data sets um, that have been collected by others, whether this is internally in our own organizations at Rensselaer, with partners, or just in general. So these tend to be data sets collected in traditional ways, such as government or agency data sets. Increasingly, the data sets are digitized and hopefully have proper descriptions, clear provenance, consent uh, is easy to obtain for use, reuse. And then what that does is we can eliminate the need to collect the same data over and over again. So data hubs and repositories really proliferated in the 2000s, specifically ones that aim to collect and organize these data sets and make them open and easier to find and use. So when I initially designed this uh, demonstration portion of the workshop, I kind of had one cohesive theme for the data demonstration and one example project on the interfaces. Usually in library instruction, you have a copy of a class assignment, demonstrate the databases with an example for students to emulate later. But I realized there's so much data, I didn't wanna to be too US centric with so much open data in the world today. So. In the global spirit of Rensselaer, I decided to branch out and we'll use some more variation in my examples. So what I want to do is jump right in and begin with World Bank Open Data, because this is a catalog everyone can access. And I think a demonstration will get us in the mood for workshopping before we start talking about rights or theories of locating data sets or organizing your found data. We'll just get our feet wet here, and then we'll circle back to these other things later. So created in 1944, World Bank is an international financial institution that provides grants and loans to governments of poorer nations for the pursuit of capital projects. And they also happen to have one of the best open data initiatives that encourages reuse, and they have a phenomenal open data repository. I've provided you a list of themes present in the World Bank Open Data Catalog here on my deck. Uh, I'm not going to read the slide, but you can see we might go here for finding data sets on inequality, people, environment, economy, markets, and global links. So let's start at data.worldbank.org. So I would just type it up into my browser right here, data.worldbank.org. And here you can see uh, data that is available country-wise or it is available indicator-wise. If you click on country, you'll see I, I have an alphabetical list here. Uh, for this example, let's click Iran. So we'll do I and we'll do uh, Iran. So this will give you a glance view here. So for instance, if I looked at life expectancy, I can see life expectancy in Iran was about age 45 in 1960. And I can see that in 2018, uh, life expectancy in Iran is about 76. I can also click on this details button here to get more information about the uh, about the methodology, the sources, the limitations, etc. If I scroll down, I can click on the all metadata link. 
I'm the metadata librarian at Rensselaer. So what is metadata again? That's right, it's data about data. So let's look at the metadata here. You can see in this descriptive metadata about this data, if I look at the license type, you can see I've got CC by 4.0 right in, in this field here. So what this means is that the data has a Creative Commons license, specifically an Attribution 4.0 international license. And what this means is I can share, copy, redistribute the material in any medium or format, adapt, remix, transform, and build on this material for any purpose, even commercially. Um, I just have to give credit through attribution, provide a link to the license, and indicate if I made changes. So we're going to talk in a little more detail about licenses later, but for now, um, the point is to show you what the metadata uh, can indicate here for you. And um, obviously, this metadata indicates we can make use of this data in our project, and we could even combine it or mash it up with another data set. So going back to metadata, you can see I now have a few options for downloading this data. And since this is a workshop on gathering found data, let's take a look at how this is done. On my top right, I've got my download options here. And so I can choose from Excel, CSV, or a tabbed uh, text file, whatever you like. You can also click on these advanced options down here where you can specify what you'd like included or excluded. For my purposes, I'm going to take the comma separated value file because these delimited files are universal, um, platform free, easy to work with. They've been ar around a really long time. So I'm just going to select my CSV option and I'll unzip my file. And let's take a look at it. So now I've got my data here for life expectancy at birth, not just for Iran, but for all countries. And I can see a list of those countries as I scroll through. And at this point, you might be saying, wait a second, Brendan, there are only 195 countries in the world. And of course, you'd be right. So what I can do is I can go to this um, Add Country tab in the metadata section, and then I can do some investigation. And I can see here that there are region and lending categories, as well as um, UN classification categories in addition to just country names. So I can actually uh, go in here and I can customize the data I download in my set if I just wanted, say, 195 countries. So let's go back to our pictorial and graphical representations. I'm going to close out of the metadata. And I'm just going to give this page a refresh. All right, and we'll scroll down and um, just to show visualization again, let's just look at the average rainfall um, by month. And uh, we're in this climate change section. So let's say I, I want to use this data. I'm going to scroll back up to the top. And here again, we've got our download options on the right. And I can do CSV, XML, or Excel. We'll do Excel this time just to keep everything in one place. And I'm going to open this, uh, this book. And you'll see I've got the data here, and then I've got two, two worksheets of metadata. And one is for indicators, while as the other is for countries. So we have 1,432 indicators in this file, actually. Um, 
And you can use indicators in your browsing and searching in this catalog too. Some are super useful, others are not as useful. But the good thing is um, since I'm in Excel, I can arrange these pretty easily now um, using, using sort. Uh, by the way, when I talk about indicators um, right here, you might be thinking, what's an indicator? The indicators are sometimes called WDI throughout the site um, or indicators, which stands for World Development Indicators. This is World Bank's compilation of cross-country comparable data on development. So let's talk about indicators. If I go back to my landing page, so data.worldbank.gov, we browsed by country. This time, let's browse by indicator. So if I click on this indicator link, it means I want to browse by indicators. And let's say I want um, data on gross domestic product. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to type GDP into the quick search bar here on the right. So not this big search bar, but this quick search bar. So I'll run a search for GDP. And I'm getting all those indicators where GDP has been used and is highlighted in the results. So um, let's say I want GDP growth. So under economy and growth, I can um, click on GDP growth annual percentage. And now this page is giving me what exactly? This page is giving me indication of GDP growth in the world. So this is how the, um, how the GDP is declining over the years. So this might be a good um, indication or set for some of our management students who are with us today, our business students, just so I'm not overly focused on examples uh, for machine learning and AI projects. I could also look at the GDP overall data by clicking on uh, GDP current right here. So GDP current, what's this total value of the GDP? So we can see the GDP increase. So presently, the entire globe has a worth of about 88 trillion. If I look all the way down at 1960, I can see the worth of 1.37 trillion for the entire world. If I scroll down, I can also see data country-wise, uh, which is very helpful. So sticking with our Iran example, I could go down to my eyes and click there. Um, but since this session has a focus on big data, let's just click back on our browser and we're going to grab the data set for the world. Uh, so let's download this data on the right this time. What I want is I want my data in XML format. So there are many advantages to XML. It's extensible, it's platform independent. You can query it, do all kinds of stuff with it. Um, probably its main criticism is how uh, verbose it is. Uh, but I think it's still uh, great for data transmission and data preservation. So. Let's look at the XML file. I'm gonna open it in Oxygen. If you want a nice free XML program, I suggest uh, Notepad++ and installing the free XML and XML tools plugin. Um, so I use XML in my job constantly along with its uh, programming language XSLT and then XPath for querying the data in it. So beyond the scope of the workshop today, but the flexibility of XML can give uh, you a lot with your data and metadata. It can be uh, really powerful, really great. We can see our data here tagged in XML with our XML elements and attributes in place. And so it's nice and organized for us to manipulate later.
So that's World Bank. And again, it's great for a business management student to analyze financial positions or environmental, social, economical data that's already been collected. And you can gather the data in a variety of different formats. So let's just review this section. We learned to browse by country. We visualized our data on the web interface. We interpreted the data's metadata, and we looked at the license for our data set. We also downloaded data sets in a variety of formats, CSV, Excel files, and XML. Now that we used our first interface, I want to cover a couple of things we encountered that are important for any found data workshop. The first is on information seeking behaviors. So when locating found data, it's important to consider whether you're finding data sets or discovering data sets. If you're finding a data set, you already know the data set exists and what the data set's called. Today, we're gonna to be focused more on data set discovery for locating our found data, meaning we don't know what it's called or whether or not it exists or how we might like to use it yet. So we're visiting some sites that have visualizations like we just saw on World Bank, or we might look at some um, code projects other people have done, like when we look at some of the applications on data.gov to get some ideas and to elucidate how this find data, this found data might be useful to us. Now, the next thing that I would like to talk about are licenses. There could be an entire workshop on licenses um, because they're also used in academic publishing and so many different things apart from data sets. So this is really just to give you some highlights. Most of the data sets we find come with a license and allow for the conditions on which it can be used and reused. If it does not have a license, you'll want to obtain the necessary permissions. So we're looking at sources today where you won't need to worry about this, but when you go out on your own to obtain your found data, you'll want to be aware of licensing. The first group of licenses are the most well-known and very frequently seen with found data sets. These are called Creative Commons licenses. You can see their icons pictured on the top right. These are international licenses that ease the restrictions of traditional copyright. I put a star on the CC BY 4.0 license because that's the one we had in our first example data set on Iran in World Bank, remember? So we saw it in the metadata. And I'm just going to click on the website now. Um, and scroll so we can see the different types of Creative Commons licenses that are available. Um, the link is here so you can go back and look at this on your own. You'll also notice in your exploration there are other licenses similar to this that also um, ease the restrictions of copyright and are a bit lesser known but allow you to reuse and remix. The second type of license I want to show you is the U.S. government work license. So this example on the right here uh, goes to a data set on hourly precipitation in the U.S. And we're going to see this when we move on to data.gov. So like Creative Commons, it allows for use and reuse. This license generally lets you create derivatives and you could combine with other data sets. You can reproduce the work and display the work. So this covers what I wanted to talk about in regard to licenses today. You don't want to find an excellent data set somewhere on the web, only to realize it's a uh, fully copyrighted and proprietary work. So this dovetails nicely into the guide that I prepared today. Um, and I prepared this for our workshop. This is going to link you to free data sets, most if not all of which can be used and combined with attribution. This is a really small list. I was focusing on a tight list of high quality sites just so that you would all have somewhere to go as a jumping off point after the workshop ends. Um, 
and many of them do have API options to download uh, as well. And I'll touch on that later. I was going to put the link in the chat, but Liz beat me to it. So thank you so much, Liz. Uh, that's a link. Um, and you can just bookmark that for later. And I'll give you a preview of what it looks like. And so you can hover and get some more information here about exactly what each of these uh, sites has to offer. All right, let's move on to our next interface. We are going to look at how we can use statistical abstracts of the United States to get data sets. Um, there's a friendly URL here that I can also put in the chat. Um, and I apologize in advance to the alumni and the people unaffiliated with Rensselaer. You won't be able to access this today. The good news is when we reopen, you can access it from the library when you're in our IP range. And most institutions, if you're affiliated with another institution, and many public libraries also provide access to statistical abstract of the United States. Now, this is a great tool for tracking down data sets. ProQuest took over publishing the statistical abstract from the census in 2013. A new abstract is added every year, and this lets researchers compare data across a long time span and look at trends. Has anyone used this database before or the print version? Um, you can just send me a message in the chat if you've used it before. You don't have to send it to everyone, but I'd like to hear what you have to say. So I'm going to start by opening a browser window. And I'm going to take you through this the long way. So I'm going to start at library.rpi.edu. If you don't have our library website booked, uh, bookmarked, you should bookmark it or just remember that URL. And I'm going to click on databases. And here I can narrow my databases by subject, by type. I can do a search for a database. I'm going to click on S because this is called Statistical Abstracts. And I'm going to click on Statistical Abstract of the US. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to authenticate. And I'm going to log in. And now I have access to the database. So before this was a database, it was published as a print reference book. So the interface has that chapter-like functionality built into it. Uh, one person says they have used this before in the, the print version, so thank you. Uh, you can browse by um, nutrition. So say, for instance, you had a basic question about nutrition. You know it's going to be in section three here, health and nutrition. So you just go to that section. You'll click on the hyperlink to that chapter, and it will open up that section for you. Uh, so you've got several options on the screen here. Let's go through those together. In particular, I want to show you the filters heading, the dates covered filter, which we'll uh, try in a moment down here, dates covered and uh, the tables heading as well. So if you click on download section PDF right here, this is basically going to give you the book. So this is a chapter of a book that you can use to see what this looked like in print. Um, so I've gone ahead and done that. You can see I've got this about 65 page file with headings, tables, not really um, a good way to work with the data itself, right? Like I'm not going to scroll through this thing and copy and paste tabular data from it. That's pretty inefficient, but the chapter information is broad in scope, so it makes for a good reference point to have. So let's go back to our interface. And on the left under filters, 
These are the facets that you can apply. If you want to email or print your results, you have icons over here on your right hand side. Um, so say I want to email myself table 141. I'm going to check that box, click my email button. I'm going to send it off to my RPI email. And that's all you have to do. Um, the next thing I want to show you under the filters is this date range. So the dates covered filter is based on your results. So for this section, health and nutrition, we can see the range is 1960 to 2040. What that means is there is information that goes back to the 60s and there is projected information that goes all the way forward to 2040. So the thing to keep in mind is that this date range dynamically changes based on what section you're in. So for example, if I was uh, in the, uh, let's say population section, section one, my dates would range uh, from 1790 to 2060. If you're in a section that has no projected data, you wouldn't see anything past 2020. And I just point that out because it's a common issue. People want the projected data to see what could happen in 2030, but sometimes no one has collected that yet. So let's say I just want 2000 to uh, 2025. I simply have to adjust my values and click apply. And this is going to adjust the tables I'm getting in my results. So let's click on one of the results here. Now you can see the table here as well as how this table is indexed, publication information, source, durable URL, and citation information. We'll come back to this after we do searching, but I'm just going to click on the download icon here just to give you a sense of when you download this file, what it's going to look like in Excel. So here's your table in Excel. All right, so let's move on to searching now. The search functionality allows you to search in a number of ways. You can search by current or specific year. You can search by uh, table number. You can use keywords and you can also put something in quotes to return an exact string. So uh, default is going to come up as 2020, but one nice thing to do is if you drop down and select all editions, you can get uh, data from all editions. So another thing that you could do is if we search for solar, You can apply limits to your source, and you can also see that you can look for specific um, in your limits here. You can look for specific uh, regions and countries, and these will vary depending on what you've searched for. Um, one of the most powerful limits that you have, I need to get a different set of results, but one really powerful limit is breakdown by. So breakdown by uh, is great because you might be working with a researcher or you're publishing um, or you're a student who needs the data broken down by a specific education, a specific group, specific age, a specific sex. And this is a good way to eyeball those results to see if that's even something that's in the realm of possibility. And the last thing I want to cover is the new tables. So every year new tables are added. You can find this under section zero, new tables. And just to be clear, these are the tables that the editors have added after the 2020 edition has already been published. So ProQuest statistical and data editors might add this section if something in the news comes up or they get a bunch of requests, they'll add them throughout the year. So let's take a look at new tables. 
I can see we've had 33 new tables added. I looked at this earlier and there are tables on ride hailing information like Uber and Lyft. There's voter information, uh, going out on election day versus early voting or alternatives. I can also use my subject terms filter, subject. And so um, if I click on the first one, Black Americans, it narrows my results down to 11 tables. And I can choose a table that interests me. So um, let's say our fifth result, table 1439. And this is where I'm going to show you what's perhaps the most powerful and useful aspect of this database for big data. And that's its ability to lead you to larger data sets from the smaller table. So if I go down here and I look at source, I can see that these statistics come from the FBI. So clicking on that link, it's taken me to the FBI's Criminal Justice Information Services. And if I scroll down to the bottom, I can click on the Crime Data Explorer. And you can see that I can explore by location and data set. I can also go down here where it says use data in your project. And if I click on it, I can see all downloads and I can get the master file. I can also click on additional data sets and download those various data sets here. So this is just to demonstrate how you can use statistical abstract of the US to point you in the direction of getting a large data set by looking at the source field. So now I'm just gonna click on another table here. And every table in this database has a source, a durable URL and a citation. The source section is good because a student can verify their source or use it to branch out and find some big data like I just demonstrated. It also might give you more information on why that data was collected, why those data were collected. And this durable URL is excellent for showing where your data came from, and it gives you a way to access it later without having to replicate your searching or browsing. So you can authenticate right to the table and begin working with that data. The URL up top, that's going to expire with your session uh, just because this is a protected database for Rensselaer. So just make sure you grab this durable URL down here. Let's review what we learned in the session. You can now browse and search statistical abstract, and you can query this database and refine your search by using filters and facets. You can now share, download, and edit statistical data. And you can now use that source section in a table to discover a bigger data set for download from a reputable source. Okay, finally, I think this is what some of you have been waiting for. We're going to move on to data.gov. So this is a beast. It's a very popular and very well-known repository site for accessing high value machine readable data sets. The data is open so you can download the open data and use the data. So all you have to do is just put data.gov in your browser address or query your favorite commercial search engine for data.gov, it should come up right in your um, first result there. Um, now, what data.gov is, is it's a clearinghouse for locating government data sets and APIs. And it's not just federal data sets, you can find state and local and tribal government data as well. So here you can find many data sets from different departments of the US government. Anyone can download this data or use it for development in their applications. This repository has proved really invaluable to many researchers and startups since it launched in 2009. So just to give you some examples of what you could use the found data on data.gov for, uh, you could use this clearinghouse to get resources that 
you can use for building apps, interfaces, visualizations, AI and machine learning projects, or traditional research. And you can do things with this data that's been made available from government agencies that may fall outside of the scope of that particular agency. So the agency collected it, but they're not developing with it. So that creates a nice open data opportunity for you as an end user. On our navigation ribbon here on the top, if we click on topics, we can see different data sets organized by topic. So agriculture, climate, ecosystems, energy, local government, maritime data, ocean. We're going to click on maritime. You'll see a highlights section up on the top. And if you scroll, there will be blurbs for updates. If I click on the data tab here, I'll get results for data sets on the maritime topic. So these are maritime data sets. And as a side note, you will encounter a lot of broken or dead links on this site. So you just have to be a little persistent in your data questing. This is a site where it's sometimes better to have an idea of what you might want to search rather than just browsing because it's so huge. And for certain data, you might be better going somewhere more specific for a data set. So for instance, if I was looking for um, US geography on the census, I'd probably be better served finding my geography by going directly to data.census.gov. Now, another neat thing that I want to show you is if I go uh, back to data.gov and I go to data.gov slash applications, but I will spell it correctly. Uh, I can see software applications using open US government data. So this can be a really good place if you're stuck on an idea to go and get some inspiration and see some applications that are using open data from data.gov. If you click on this contact tab, top right, you can actually submit questions here and you can even request too. You can make a request uh, for new data and they have a good response time. I've, I've tried this out. Now we're gonna get into searching in a second, but the last thing I wanna show you are the APIs of data.gov. So probably everyone has at least heard of an API or an application programming interface, but if not, welcome to the excitement. So I'm gonna click on developers and I'm gonna click on APIs. And gathering data using APIs is beyond the scope of our workshop today. But if you are a programmer or you even just develop some basic uh, scripting skills or just want to edit variables and parameters, these can be an incredibly powerful way, not just to gather or harvest found data, but to interact with that data and do amazing things with it as well. So note the data.gov CCAN API and its base URL here. This API contains only the metadata about the data sets, not the data sets themselves. So the data about data, like the URLs, the descriptions of the data sets. Many government agencies have their own API that you can easily register and get an API key for. So NASA is a really cool one to check out. I recommend that. I can click on browse the current catalog for APIs here. And I can see APIs from across the government agencies. Uh, I'm going to encounter lots of RESTful APIs. So this is definitely something to look into. Many of the data repositories on the library guide I prepared offer APIs. So Quandl has a free API. NOAA, National Centers for Environmental Information, has an API. If you request a free uh, web services token, again, totally free. Same with Federal Reserve economic data, same with census. Uh, a workshop on found data and open data really just would not be complete without at least mentioning APIs and showing you where to go. So that's just to give you a taste of APIs today and to encourage you to explore further. But now we'll return to the data.gov page and searching. So. 
I can use this big central search bar here, or if I click on data in the navigation menu, I can get presented with some more advanced search functionality. In particular, I wanna show you the filters and the facets on the left here. I can narrow by location. I can choose topic categories. If I scroll a bit, this is my favorite. If I scroll a bit, I can choose formats. This is a powerful filter if I have a format preference. I, I just saw quickly in the questions, somebody wanted to know where they could get more XML data sets. This is a good way to um, filter that. So uh, say I have a, a format preference and I just I don't have time on hand to convert files from CSV to XML and so forth, or I don't want HTML results, or I only want to search for APIs. So um, when I expand this, I can see there are many different format facets and I can apply my filters to the ones I need. I can also use these after I conduct my search to narrow my results. So let's head back to the main page and use that big search bar now. So let's say I'm making a chat bot that's going to chat with people about consumer complaints about various uh, products and services. We focused more on data set discovery so far, but this example is more data set finding, right? I have the knowledge already that the US government makes data on consumer complaints available to the public. I may even know specifically that the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau provides a federal consumer complaint database. And maybe this is general knowledge I have, or maybe I saw this referenced somewhere in a study I read, but I know it exists. So on the main page here, I'm just gonna type in consumer complaint. And then I'm gonna run my query. And on the right hand side here, what's nice is that I can see this banner tells me it's federal data. And below I can see that there's some data for states as well. So in my second result, I can interact with it as a CSV or an RDF, that's what's called the resource description framework, or in JSON, or in XML. In my first result, I've got a CSV option, but I've also got this uh, JSON uh, JavaScript object notation. So this is a data interchange format that's super lightweight and easy for a machine to parse and generate. It's not super verbose like the XML we looked at earlier. And if you are also a Java or JavaScript person, you'll appreciate the syntax. But either way, it's entirely human readable. So I am going to now download the JSON file because in our theoretical example here, uh, we'll say I'm going to later prepare this data set to feed into a machine learning model. Now this is gonna take a minute to download, actually a couple of minutes. Um, so what we'll do is uh we'll this is actually a massive data set that i don't really care to open right now during a live webex event so what i did was i opened it uh earlier in visual studio and grabbed a screenshot of the json file just to give you a sense of just how clean and lightweight uh, json is and how you the human even without any uh, knowledge of this or any syntax highlighting can easily read the data in the file and see the information from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's Consumer Complaint Database. So this concludes what I wanted to cover today on data.gov. Let's take a minute to review and revisit what we went over. We located data sets browsing by topic. We looked at software applications using US government open data from data.gov. We learned how to ask a question and how to submit a request for new data or new data.gov features. We learned how to access the APIs of data.gov using the catalog, and we noted the base URL for the data.gov CCAN API. And finally, we found a large data set together 
by searching and we downloaded it as a JSON file. And of course, if we were more comfortable with Excel files or CSVs, we could get it that way too. Lastly, we want to organize our found data. Now, again, there could be a whole course on data set organization and preservation, but I just want to mention two things today that will make a big difference later. So first, you want to use a hierarchical structure to keep track of the data you found for your project so you know where it is in your tree, um, sort of like on, on the right here. So it's important right away to create directories and subdirectories that are appropriately named. The other thing I suggest is creating a readme for your data. Any developers here will be familiar with this concept, but it's crucial for documenting your data for your project, and it'll save you future headaches. I have a link here to a guide from Cornell that even gives you a template you can download for data set readme files. This is definitely overkill for the undergrads, but I do want to just emphasize that you should at minimum include the date you found the data, the link to where the data can be accessed, and any licenses or restrictions you noted on the data. You'll want some kind of documentation and version control for your found data. You'll definitely thank yourself later. Two other resources that I want to mention today for finding data sets. These are a little bit more informal, which is why they're not on the library guide. But I would suggest Kaggle, a Google subsidiary. It's an online community of practitioners of machine learning and data scientists. And I'd also suggest the subreddit for data sets. This is a great place you can go and talk to people and also to find uh, data sets people have posted and also request found data. It's a very knowledgeable community. Now, at this time, we're going to revisit our learning objectives that we set out at the beginning of the workshop. While we had session reviews for the interfaces, this final review will put the pieces together from all sections and bring us full circle. So first, we met our objective of increased data literacy. We now have an understanding of different types of licenses like Creative Commons licenses and US government work licenses. We know how to organize the found data sets we collected using hierarchies and readme files. And finally, we have our library guide with the list of found data repositories and clearinghouses that will link us to resources where we can find high quality data sets on our own. Our second objective of using uh, user interfaces was met by interacting with three different front end UIs. So those were to recap World Bank Open Data, ProQuest Statistical Abstract of the US, and data.gov. And for our fourth objective, we understood ways to locate found data sets by using browse or search, or a combination of browse search functionalities on the UIs on these various platforms. And finally, we saw how we can find or discover open data sets. Um, we talked a little bit about the theory of information seeking behaviors, and we put this into practice as we use different strategies for getting large open data sets using all three of these interfaces. So on behalf of the Rensselaer Libraries, I want to sincerely thank everyone who attended this workshop. I want to especially thank our ARCH students and wish them the best summer possible given the circumstances and also wish them good luck on their project. And I hope everyone who attended today got at least something out of this workshop. We had quite a range of people across various disciplines. So once again, thanks for coming out this afternoon. Um, I can see there are some questions. I am going to hang around for a couple of minutes and take questions. So let me just go ahead and stop the recording here.